everyone this evening. I welcome those that are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Joe will be bringing us a message in just a moment, and Gary will be leading our singing. And if you will, bow with me and we'll go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to gather as your children, to open your word and study from it, to sing these songs of praises. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our worship is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We're mindful, Heavenly Father, of the sin that's in our life. We pray that you would forgive us as we repent, that we would stand pure and white in your sight. We're also mindful of the unrest in this world. We pray that you'd be with the leaders, that they would look to you for the guidance that they need. We're mindful, Heavenly Father, of troops on foreign soil defending the rights of others and the freedoms of this country. We pray that you continue to be with them and their families as they wait for their return. We'd ask now that you'd help us put those cares of this world aside, that we could open our hearts and our minds to your word and your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Turn please to 294. 294. <clears throat> Let's sing it through twice, please. Wonderful. Hundred fifty four, please. <coughs> we have some young ones present tonight that want to sing Jesus Loves Me. And maybe not so young, huh, Jordan? <laughs> yeah. Nine five four. Jesus loves me. Eight hundred forty seven. Eight hundred forty seven. Let's sing verses one and two, please. Here I lay. Amen. 
chapter tonight is 863. What shall it be? 863. Good. Let's open our Bibles, your copy of God's Word, to 2 Kings chapter 8, and that's where we'll begin our study today. 2 Kings chapter 8. One of the characteristics that we have uh, seen uh, in these two books, 1 and 2 Kings, is the picture uh, that will prepare us for something to come. We always see something. Uh, an example would be Elisha caused the axe head to flow once the axe head uh, with the, when the prophets were building or cutting logs for their new place to stay because they're growing so much, and Elisha caused the axe head to float. And that by itself, uh, that, that, that floating axe head kind of seemed a little illogical, out of place, wondering why Elisha did that. Uh, but when this miracle is connected to the events that followed in chapter 6, we see that the miracle was a picture uh, of the restoration that God was offering uh, to Israel by trying to, to open their eyes and uh, get them to see that God is still working in Israel even though they have moved far away. Uh, that's not going to change when we get to chapters 8, 9, and 10 of the book of 2 Kings. We're going to read an account that seems to be, uh, to, to be one of those events, and, but we'll see how, it, how, it, how it's deeply connected uh, to the events that follow. So we've got to remember that each point being made <clears throat> shows another aspect uh, of God's character and what he expects from us uh, as we learn that knowledge. So in the first six, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll get it, get it out in a minute. <clears throat> I think I got some sand still in there somewhere. Uh, those first six verses of, of, of chapter 8, uh, 2 Kings 8, opens uh, with our minds, our attention, I guess, kind of turning back to the Shunammite woman. Now, we haven't read about her since chapter 4. Uh, and so it's brought back up. She was the one who was providing for uh, Elisha as he traveled back and forth. And remember, she also made a place for him to stay. And so Elisha had promised her a son. We remember that the son was born. And then sometime later, the son died and Elisha uh, went back and raised her son from the dead. That's all in chapter 4. And, and she is the one who knew... Um, uh, what she uh, could obtain uh, from this man of God. She also knew that he was a man of God. We're told in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1, look there. Now Elisha said to the woman whose son had, uh, he had restored life to, Arise and depart from your household, and sojourn wherever you can, for the Lord has called for a famine, and it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. And so... Uh, and so this famine is going to take over the land, and, and now she is going to move somewhere else. She's going to go hither and yon. Uh, I always remember that, hither and yon. Or there's a book that came out, I guess, when I was right out of high school, uh, maybe when I was in high school, hither and yon through historic Murray County. I don't know if Humphreys County had one back then, but uh, I try to incorporate hither and yon in my vocabulary at least once a year. So hither and yon she moved. Uh, for a time because there's going to be a, sam a, a, fam a famine for seven years. I'll get that out. Not salmon for seven years. Famine for seven years. So back in chapter 6, back in chapter 7, we read about that devastating famine. Uh, she and her family lived uh, in Philistia for, for, for some uh, seven years, just as Elisha told her to do. Once the seven years are over, she comes back. But when she and her family returns, it seems that somebody has taken her land. Somebody has taken what was hers, and so she, uh, she's, she's got to go get it back somehow. So we, our, our attention is turned. Uh, it happened that, the, that Gehazi, the servant of, of Elisha, uh, who had restored the woman's life, um, was sitting and, and speaking with the king. He's teaching the king. Uh, that also tells us that God is still trying to work through the life of this wicked king, through the miracles and teaching of, of Elijah, 
And Gehazi is actually telling the king of the Shunammite woman. He's telling her of the, of the woman's son who was brought back to life by Elijah. And as he's doing that, the woman whose son was raised from the dead walks in the room and Gehazi says, this is the woman that I'm talking to you about. Now, when we see that, we see that she asked for all of her land back. Uh, and and the, so the king commands and demands uh, that all that was taken from her is restored, including all the income of her land from the day she left until the day she came back. So she got back pay, in other words. And so the woman had her son's life restored by the power of God. She had her house and land restored because of the power of God. And the woman has her income for the past seven years that she's been living uh, in Philistia, uh, restored to her through the power of God. And the command to give and restore everything to her was through the power of God. What they're failing to see is God working in their lives. Now, the Shunammite woman does not fail to see that. Gehazi does not fail to see that. Elisha does not fail to see that. But the king still fails in seeing that. How many times in our life do we see God working or do we miss, a better question, how do we, do we miss God working in our life? Our trip started out very interesting this last week. We had a blowout on the interstate. Now, y'all know me pretty well, right? I flung our luggage out the back of that van. Not our van, my brother-in-law's van. I flung the luggage out the back of the van, and I lifted up everything and got to the very bottom, and there was no spare tire. I looked under, there was no spare tire. My sweet daughter, middle child, number two, calmly is looking in the glove box for the book, calmly finds that the, the spare tire on these vans is behind the back seat, the front seat, in between the front seat and the, and the, and the second row of seats in the little hidden compartment. I was changing that tire on the side of the road. I had shunned all of my children and wife to the, to the, to the nethers, and so if a vehicle did come by and hit us, it was only taking me out. Very, very, very upset. We had just come through two torrential downpours on the way down there. And after we get it in, we're driving down the road, and everybody in the car is completely quiet. I looked over to Marlena, and I said, I have failed. What? I said, I just failed. God tested us, and I failed. We came all this way. We're on the south side of Montgomery, Alabama. We have come all this way on a tire with wire showing in it. Didn't, didn't know. Uh, we had come through two major rainstorms, and the tire went flat on the side of the road, where the rain had not yet come to. Now you can tell me, Joe, that's just happenstance, that's circumstance. And I will tell you that God allowed us to get that far. Uh, and, and God allowed us to be able to change that tire. God led us to, 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 a, to a nice man uh, in Eufaula, Alabama. I think that's the name of the town. Uh, called Fry Link. Uh, barely used tires. And he and I struck up a conversation. Our dads both passed away in November of 2019, and it was just a conversation that went on, and we blessed each other that day. Uh, but how many times in our life do we fail to see God working in our life? How many times do we get so busy and wrapped up with the everyday things going on that we fail to see that God still works in the lives of his children? Uh, that's the big message. That is the message that we see overall thus far in, in, these, in these books, First and Second Kings, that God is working in the lives of his children, even though they're still very wicked. Now, I'm not calling you wicked by any means, but I'm just telling you God is still working in our life. In verses 7 through 15, God is going to start moving some pieces on the board around for his purpose. And Elisha goes to Damascus, that's in Syria. While he's in Syria, the, the king of Syria is pretty sick. And so when he learns that Elisha is in Damascus, he sends a zeal to, uh, to inquire whether uh, he's going to recover from this illness. And so Hazel goes with gifts uh, and, and, and he meets and asks Elisha, is the king going to recover? Now, in verse 10 of chapter 8, Elisha tells him that he should tell the king that you're going to recover. But the Lord has already shown me that you're going to certainly die. Then Elijah just stares. Look at the, look at the scriptures, guys. Elijah literally stares at Hazel, just stares at him. Now, 
when upon reading this, and you stop right there, and you begin to understand why is he just staring at him until Hazel feels very ashamed. It seems very strange and illogical on the surface. Uh, tell him he's going to recover, but eventually he's going to die. We all know that. But how's that going to happen? You're going to recover from the illness, but you're going to die. So uh, Elijah tells him that he knows all the harm that he's going to do to Israel. Hazel now asks, how am I going to tell the king that you're going to get better, but you're going to die? That's kind of redundant. Elisha tells him that he's going to be the king of Israel. In other words, Hazel, you're going to be the next king of, uh, of, of I'm sorry, Syria. So Hazel leaves and he tells the king that he's going to recover. Uh, and then that night he takes a thick bed cover, dips it in water, and smothers him to death. Thus fulfilling the prophecy of Elisha. So then Hazel takes over as king, and this explains that prophecy. Elisha knew as he's staring into the eyes of Hazel that what Hazel was going to do, the king is going to recover, but it's not going to matter because Hazel, you're going to kill him. And, and so then the weeping over Israel because of the judgment is because of the judgment that, that is going to be executed against him. Uh, and so an interesting shift takes place in verse 16, if you'll follow with me there. In chapter 8, in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, when Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, Jehoram, uh, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. So a focus is now turned to the southern kingdom of Judah. And to make uh, things really confusing uh, is Jehoshaphat's son's name is Jehoram, and Ahab's son's also's name is Jehoram. So we have two Jehorams reigning over Israel and Judah, and verse 16 tells us, uh, uh, as verse 16 tells us. Uh, so the son of Jehoshaphat walked in the ways of the kings of Israel before him, just like Ahab. We're told why in verse 18, for the, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And so we, we know that he walked in that wicked way as well. And Jehoram's wife was the daughter of Ahab, and that explains the devotion that Jehoshaphat had to Ahab and helping Israel uh, and to helping Israel. Jehoshaphat's son was married to Ahab's daughter and he did what was side in the evil of the Lord. Verse 19 makes an important point. Look at chapter 8 and verse 19. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah for the sake of David his servant since he promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. The, the rest of the section is showing how the kingdom is disintegrating before their eyes, but we know the Lord will not destroy Judah because he promised David that he would maintain a lamp for David and his descendants. In verse 20, we see Edom rebelling against Judah and the Edomites winning when Jehoram, Jeho, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting in a hurry. Jehoram tried to bring them back into submission. The nation of Israel has been continually disintegrating, losing nations and cities that surrounded it. Now the nation of Judah has the same disintegration in the kingdom taking place. What is the, the factor with both of them? The factor with both of them is they keep moving away from God. They keep moving away from God. We had this conversation this morning. The further we move away from God, the worse our life is going to get. Now I'm not saying that God, God is, I'm not preaching to you a prosperity gospel that if you uh, remain Faithful, and you remain strong in, in Christ, um, that you're going to be a billionaire, a trillionaire, that you're going to have a big house or, or nice cars or fancy clothes. That's not what, what the Bible teaches. But God's Word does tell us if we draw near to God, He draws near to us. The Bible, the New Testament Scriptures tell us if, if God is for us, who can be against us? And so I hope we're understanding that the further we move away from God in our hearts, in our minds, the, the more chaotic our life is going to be as Christians. Think about that for a moment. Think about the chaotic times in your life. Not everybody in this room or everybody listening to this or who will or might listen to this. You've not, you've not been a, a grade A perfect all your life. You've lived outside of, of the law of God. You've lived outside or lost in, in this world away from the, from the cross of Christ. You remember how chaotic your life was? I certainly do. I'm not holding that up as, a, as something to be proud of, as a trophy. I just remember how chaotic my life really was the more I moved away from God. There was no true joy. There was, no, um, uh, there was, no, there was nothing. There was no hope. And, and that's what we're seeing as these 
these, this, these now two kingdoms or this one nation begins just disintegrating. In verse 25, we see that the son of Jehoram, Ahazi, begins to reign in Judah next. He reigned for a year. He was king for a year. He walked in the way of Ahab and doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Ahazi and Jehoram of Israel joined forces to try to fight the Syrians, only to be beaten time and time again and Jehoram to be wounded. So Ahazi has come to visit Jehoram while he is wounded. Now in chapter 9, chapter 9 opens with Elisha telling one of the prophets to go to Ramoth Gilead to look for Jehu and to anoint him king over Israel. Things are kind of beginning to look up. Jehu comes on scene, and, and I hope you understand who Jehu is, and we're going to explain it. Uh, this is also maybe a little perplexing. Jehu is not the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. He's a different Jehu altogether. He is a commander of Israel's army. So this was God's message uh, to, Jehu, um, uh, to Jehu at the anointing. Jehu is to destroy the house of Ahab. He's to avenge the blood of the prophets and the servants of the Lord. We read that in verses 6, 7, and 8 of chapter 9. And the dogs are going to eat Jezebel in the open, and you're not even going to be able to bury her. Now, things get very interesting here, church. Get very graphic here. I've always told you that the, the Old Testament can be very graphic. So Jehu tells his men, the trumpet is blown, and the, the proclamation is made that Jehu is now the king. And so he begins his mission to wipe out every person who belongs to the house of Ahab. So he takes his head, his, his, his chariot to Jezreel uh, where uh, Jehoram is injured and Ahaziah is there with him uh, visiting him as he's wounded and as the, the, the city tries to figure out who's coming uh, someone knows that the chariot, uh, he drives the chariot like Jehu because apparently Jehu drives his chariot like, like, a, like a maniac. He drives it way too fast and so uh, I've told my children before stop driving like Jehu I've seen them come in, uh, come in the driveway. Look like on two wheels. So I've given Jehu, and they kind of look at me a little funny. Then I give them a Dukes of Hazard uh, illustration. They really look at me funny. Uh, don't be coming in here like Bo and Luke Duke, you know, running from Roscoe and Enos. And they're just like, "What is that? What are you talking about?" I, just, I have to explain ten minutes of how they missed good television growing up. So Jehu takes his chariot to where to Jezreel, where where they are. He's driving like a maniac, and Jehoram and Ahaziah go out to meet him, and they say, have you come in peace? In verse 22, uh, this, is, this is Jehu's answer. What peace can there be so long as the, the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel continue? So he draws an arrow, and, and, and uh, Jehu draws an arrow and kills Jehoram. He has his body thrown in the field uh, that belonged to Naboth, and remember what happened to Naboth's field? Uh, when Ahab desired Na uh, Naboth's field back in uh, First Kings, and, and he just boo-hooed and cried, and Jezebel had that taken for him. So he has his body taken and thrown in Naboth's field, and uh, Jehu then approaches the place where Jezebel lives. Now, this is pretty interesting. Jezebel looks out the window and calls down to Jehu, saying, Is it peace, Zamiri, murderer, murderer of your master? Now, if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, we remember that Z uh, Zemiri murdered his master to take the throne, but only lasted a week as king before he was taken out. So Jehu calls up, who's on my side? A couple eunuchs look out the window, and then Jehu looks at them and says, throw her out the window. This is Jezebel. So they throw Jezebel out the window, and this is where it gets kind of, uh, grotesque or I, I guess uh, a little macabre her blood is splattered all over the walls and the horses which trampled all over her then Jehu goes in and has a has a meal he goes in and he eats and he drinks and uh, basically he says this all in the day's work and uh, he tells him to go out and bury Jeze Jezebel but they can only find her feet they can only find her hands and they can only find her skull because the prophecy has now come true. The dogs literally ate the rest of her in the street, fulfilling what Elijah had prophesied about her in. Chapter 10, church, is more of the same as Jehu has Ahab's 70 sons killed 
according to the word of God in verse 10. Chapter 10, verse 11 uh, says that Jehu killed every, everyone who was left in the house of Ahab, leaving zero survivors um, because there's no one left. Now, verses 18 through 27, we see Jehu having all the prophets of Baal killed. Jehu demolishes the pillar that is built to the Baal, destroyed destroy the temple, and he made it a public toilet. That's what Jehu has done. Things, things are looking good for this crazy chariot driver, this, this, this Mario Andretti of chariot drivers. Jehu was zealous for the Lord because if we look, church, we're, we're going to see in verse 29 of chapter 10, go on down to verse 29 of chapter 10, and let's read what was the end. But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, that is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. And the Lord said, keep reading verse 30, to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done in the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Verse 31, but Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. Now, Jehu was very zealous for this work that God had put before him, but he was zealous when it was something that Jehu wanted to do. We ever get like that? We do, don't we? We're zealous for good works or as long as they fall in my repertoire, as long as they fall into what I want to do. We're zealous for good works as long as it doesn't take me out of my comfort zone. We're zealous for good works as long as I can remain satisfied. When did the first century church grow in the New Testament? It grew under duress. It grew under persecution. It grew under pains and sufferings and continued to grow. The members of the body of Christ in the first century church met in secret because they desired to. They went out and taught others and fulfilled the Great Commission, not because some preacher stood up in a pulpit behind a huge block of wood and pointed their finger and said, this is how you need to live and this is what you need to do. They did it because they were zealous for God. They wanted to be in heaven. They were clinging on the teachings of Christ and the apostles' teachings. Here we are with the complete word of God before us and we're only going to do the work that we're comfortable with. We're only willing to do what we desire to do when it fits our needs. Church, if we're going to be growing and continuing to, to, to grow towards spiritual maturity, we need to understand what God's word is teaching us in fullness. What can we learn from Jehu? We know that the lessons are easy from Ahab and Jehoram and those others who continually walked wickedly. But we look at Jehu and we can kind of put ourselves in, in his boots. Not that we may drive crazy. That's a good, easy part to teach about Jehu, driving his chariot like a maniac. I can visualize that. Don't know what Jehu looked like, but I can imagine he's bearing down on the reins of the, the, the horse or horses. And that chariot and the wheels clanking. But what I see from Jehu is the same downfalls that we suffer from. The same things that we, the pitfalls that we fall into. Jehu claimed to be zealous for God and, and, and looked like he was doing everything God desired for him to do, but he only obeyed God's commands when it kind of aligned with what his desires were. In reality, all that he was doing and all that we do from time to time is obeying God when we agree with God. We're zealous for the things, in other words, we're zealous for the things that we want to do. Let that sink in for a moment. Let that, let that sink in. We have an upcoming fish fry, don't we? We do. Can't wait. It's going to be wonderful. 
can this congregation use that time as an outreach? As a time to, to, to talk to others about Christ, to shore up relationships between one another? To use that time to glorify God? Or are we just not going to? You know, if it fits our needs that day, we will. And that goes for Sunday school class or Wednesday night Bible class. That goes for any work that we do in the kingdom. We see that Jehu ultimately did not want to turn aside from the sins of Jehor, uh, Jehor, I put Jeroboam, Jehoram. He did not want to be careful to follow what God said. He wanted to carefully follow only the things that God said that he wanted to do. I, I can look at Jehu and say, I understand that, Jehu. We, 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 we've done, I've done that in my life. You doing that, you've done that in your life. Being zealous for God means carefully following what God has told us to do. John chapter 14 and verse 15. You are my friends if you keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Even when we do not want to go, even when we do not understand, we still must do as the Lord commands. Amen? God never came to us and asked us our opinion regarding what we might want to do and what we might not want to do. God's Word tells us how we should live. In fact, I tell you what, Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, all the way to the New Testament. Because this is exactly what Jesus said uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. You go to Matthew 7. I have it marked here. Verse 21 and following through verse 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven... On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then when I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. We read that those verses. We read verse 21, 22, and 23. And as devout Christians and followers of God, those who hold our cuffs and say, we are zealous, O Lord, read that and say, that's not us. That can't be us. I'm there every time the doors are open. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I'm doing these things for God. But we're doing these things from the comfort of our own comfort zone. We look at that and say, that can't be me. That can't be. The Lord is talking about someone else right here. But he is talking about us, isn't he? Lots of people are going to say they are zealous for God and still not do what God has said. They're going to say the things that sound right. They're going to, to do things that are righteous and seem right. That's exactly what Jehu did, isn't it? That's exactly what Jehu did. But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam. He did not turn away from those things. He gave the look like he was. I mean, he utterly destroyed everything that God told him to do. You know why? Because he wanted to. He desired to. Church, bold faith, bold faith does all that God's word and God has commanded us to do as we await that restoration that God has promised us. What restoration? The restoration of, of our souls, that, that home in heaven, that, that time where we spend eternity with God where this life, this temporary life, is over. And eternal life has begun. So what we need to do for the next couple minutes is we need to consider and think about being zealous, truly zealous for good works. We need to challenge ourselves that if we haven't been involved in the work in the kingdom, if we haven't been zealous because we've been in our own comfort zone, we've drawn a little box and we've stayed in that box, then we need to challenge ourselves to get out. And don't be like Jehu, not only in your driving, but staying in your comfort zone. There's a big difference between being zealous for all that God has said 
and only zealous when we agree with what God has said. And the big difference is us. The big difference is our hearts. And church, you have to, you have to make a decision. God has given each of us free choice. He puts those choices before us. Heaven, if you so choose to live your life according to God's word. Well, that place, the Bible calls hell. That is designed ultimately for Satan, because he defined God, and for those who choose to follow Satan. As we look to the back to the beginning um, of, of, of chapter 8, 9, and 10 of 2 Kings, and we see this Shunammite woman, and we see this woman with no name, who's a child with no name, who ultimately is not on the radar. She's not mentioned among the kings, but here she's mentioned twice. Twice she's mentioned there because she was zealous for God's work. She was zealous for God. She, she took care of Elisha. Because she knew he was a man of God. Not different than what we call the good Samaritan. The Samaritan that, that helped uh, the Jewish man. The Israelite. We call him good because of the works he did. He probably wouldn't have called himself good. He probably just called himself all in a day's work. Are we truly zealous? Are we truly desiring to do what God wants us to do? I pray that we are, and I pray that you are. And as we come to the end of this lesson, my prayer is that if you need to repent because you have not been zealous for good works, then you'll do so. If publicly, the publicly needed, then repent publicly. If privately, as we sing this song of encouragement, sing, sing, but repent in your heart to God. Repent in your heart and be zealous for good works. Get out of your comfort zone. Uh, go out and, 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 and shake the bushes and talk to folks about God and his work right here in this county and right here in this community. And if you're not a child of God tonight, we, we plead with you to become a child of God, to become part of a family of brothers and sisters in Christ who desire to go to heaven, who desire to work for that, not in our comfort zone, but doing what God has desired for us to do. Brother Gary leads us in this song of encouragement and invitation. Realize that it is God's invitation. It is up to us to accept it or to ignore it as together we stand and as we sing. What will you do with Jesus? The question comes to you. And you must give an answer for something you must do. What shall it be? What shall it be? What shall your
We have those that are present tonight that need to partake of the Lord's Supper, and we'll do that at this time. Um, if you haven't got the emblems, we'll get someone to hand them to you. Okay. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to gather around this table to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf on that cruel cross of Calvary. As we partake of this unleavened bread, we pray that we'd remember that sacrifice, that it rep this unleavened bread represents the body that hung there on that cross. And we'll partake of it in a manner that is well-pleasing in thy sight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. In like manner, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup, the fruit of the vine, that represents the blood shed on that cruel cross, that we'll do so in a manner that is well-pleasing in thy sight and in remembrance of Jesus. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. We'll go over the announcements from this morning. Uh, need to remember uh, Becca Rhodes. Uh, she'll be seeing a surgeon on Friday about her gallbladder. Uh, Charlotte Snyder, who's Jerry Matney's sister, will have surgery for breast cancer on July the 18th. Uh, Ron Thomas, who's Kim D Dilley's biological father, has cancer and he lives in St. Louis. Uh, Dickie Davis, who is uh, Chris Davis's uh, Sheriff Chris Davis's dad um, is in Humphreys County Nursing Home. Betty Story, uh, wife of Joe Story and Brenda Moore's sister-in-law, she is at home now, but she has to, still has to be assisted with all of her daily needs and activities, and uh, has a long road of recovery. Noah Wallace is recovering from a wreck and is in Shepherd's uh, re Rehabilitation in Alabama for rehab, and his address is on the board in the foyer. Uh, Debbie Skurlock is home from the hospital, uh, waiting to make sure her infection is cleared up uh, before she has hip replacement. Uh, Jane James, who is with us tonight, thankful to see her. Uh, her platelet count is up and uh, she, she uh, started another round of chemo before her transplant. Need to continue to remember Louise Brown, Carrie Wh Carol White, uh, Doris Cooley, Dwight Garner, and Claudine Lovett. Um, I made so many notes on my original sheet this morning and failed uh, to make these announcements, but I'm thankful that Jim uh, mentioned the folks in El Salvador in his prayer when he closed this morning, uh, remember remember them as Steve and Carol are with those folks this time, and they'll be returning home Thursday on the 14th. Um, didn't know if anyone knew we'd, we'd, I'd fail to announce this as well. Jimmy King uh, home was struck by lightning last week, and it was a total loss, and he's a member of the Waverly Congregation and also continue to remember Glenwood. Um, a note of sorrow, uh, Bruce Bumpus passed away this uh, this past evening, and uh, we don't have any arrangements at this time. Humphreys County Church Fellowship will be July the 26th at 6 p.m. Country and Western, and we have a sign-up sheet on the board in the foyer. Uh, we need a count by the 20th, and Paul Gerber will be speaking uh, remember the Let Your Light Shine board, check that out. Youth Circle and KFC Circle uh, will be this Wednesday at 5.30. Our Fish Fry will be July the 16th at 5 p.m. 
and there's a sign-up sheet on the board in the foyer. Uh, Camden will be having a singing on July the 21st. Um, Pond will have a friends and family day on the 17th and a back to school bash on the 23rd. And I put both of those flyers on the board in the back in the foyer. Remember Wednesday night we'll continue our summer lecture series. Uh, Kenneth Fleming Jr. will be speaking and he'll be his topic is dedicated to the cause of Christ. How many do we have tonight? 44 tonight. Our closing song. Uh, closing song is 683. And Paul Meredith will word our closing prayer. Six hundred eighty three, let's sing verse one and two. Would you stand please? Uh, bye. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that in our lives you never fail to abide with us. And the fact that you are with us gives us hope and comfort. We're grateful that you have made yourself known supremely in your Son, Jesus Christ, and his coming and his work of atonement, so that we are not slaves to sin, but that we have freedom in Christ, and that we have hope of eternal life. As we go forward in a new week, we pray that we will never forget that hope, that we will never doubt that salvation, that we will remember your love and your abiding presence. And so give us courage, help us to have moral courage, help us to walk in the way of holiness, defeat us, Lord, in sin and shame, and uphold us along the path of righteousness. Lord, we do ask that you be with these that have been mentioned on the prayer list, those that are recovering. We're thankful and pray for a speedy recovery. Those that have upcoming tests, those that are sick or dealing with grief or sorrow, whatever it may be, we pray that you will minister to them out of your sovereign will. We do pray especially for those who are on mission campaign. We pray for their safety and their success in that effort in El Salvador. Lord, we ask that you will help us to love and serve you, to love and serve each other. Dismiss us in your care. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.